Now, this is my presentation is going to be around topics that I've been uh, on which I've been going research, doing research for a while. Uh, and for those of you who know my work, you won't be surprised by some of the statements I'll make today. It's trying to understand uh, sort of the connection between the cyclicality of fiscal policy, the need for stabilization coming through fiscal policy and the connections to potential output and to growth in general. Now, I'm very pleased to see that when you look at uh, sort of like policymakers today, uh, th there's a lot of use of the word scarring or scars uh, and trying to avoid those scars with strong policies. So I just have these two quotes, one from Gita Gopinath, the chief economist of the IMF, one from Janet Yellen uh, as the current Treasury Secretary in the Biden administration. And in both quotes, you, you hear the same thing, that we need to do our best to avoid the, the scars that the current pandemic will leave or might leave on, on output and potential output. Now, this is research, this type of topics is research that I've been doing now for many years. In fact, when I go back to the first time I wrote about this was a, a paper that I wrote back in 1993. That, that was, it didn't use the word scar, but, but it was basically about a scars of business cycles. Um, now, I remember writing this paper and at that point, th there was not a lot of interest in among academics or policymakers about this notion, partly because it was assumed that scars were something that was either small or, or, or that was something that we could ignore. Now, things have changed and they have changed partly because of what happened during the global financial crisis or the Great Recession. So, so this is a picture that many of you are familiar with. Uh, it, it looks at the real GDP of the Euro area and you have sort of three vintages of the world economic outlook of the IMF. We, we could use obviously many other sources. So the black line is sort of the way we thought about the world in 2007. Uh, and I'm using the projection that the world economic outlook does and then extending it for a few more years. Uh, in yellow, we have the, the way we saw the world in 2011. In red, the way we saw the world in 2017. So there's been this constant downgrade through the last crisis in the Euro area, but also in many other countries. Uh, and the interpretation of this downgrade, uh, at least to some of the research that I'm familiar with and some of the research that I've done myself, is about the scars that that crisis left on output. So the notion that cyclical shocks can have permanent effects on output, and this is what we call those scars. Now, when you look at the academic research, the academic research has been looking at these issues for a long time. Uh, and the two avenues that, that sort of like we, we cite to think about these scars is on one hand, growth, the, the phenomenon of growth is endogenous, the, the, the driving of that trend can be endogenous and react to cycles. Uh, and the second notion, which is also going back in time in research for the mid, to the mid eighties is the idea that labor markets can be very persistent. The response of labor markets can be very persistent and employment sometimes can be persistent or even have sort of like permanent effects through some, either some groups of the population or some long-term unemployment becoming permanent unemployed. So these are notions that we've had for a while and, and some of us are pushing the idea that the default model should be one where we recognize these effects. So some of us think that it is very natural to write models where hysteresis, which is the scars that cyclical effects leave on output, should be a default. Rather than making an exception, rather than making sort of a particular case, that should be sort of the natural way of writing about it. I've recently written a paper with Valerie Serra and Sueta Saxena, which is sort of trying to review this literature uh, and provide sort of a survey of the literature on hysteresis. Now, in this world, when it comes to understanding the implications of fiscal policy, but also monetary policy and stabilization policy, the effects of cyclical policies can be more powerful. They can be more powerful because they go, they go beyond sort of the second moment of output. They can affect potential output and they can affect permanently the trend of output. Now that powerfulness come obviously with a warning, which is if we make errors, if we don't use optimal fiscal or monetary policy, those errors will be more costly. Now there's an element which is not always part of this story of scars and stories of hysteresis, which I also think we should take into account when we think about modeling is the notion that when we think about cycles, when we think about shocks, we need to be serious about the fact that for most economies, these shocks look very asymmetric. So negative shocks are obvious in the form of recession, positive shocks are much less obvious. Now, why is that important? Let me just bring a, a picture which comes from the US, but I, I, we could look at many other economies uh, in similar ways. So this is the unemployment rate in the US around each of the previous recessions going back to 1950. 
we're very familiar with this picture. We all use it when we teach about unemployment and we see the peaks of unemployment in every recession. But what is interesting is what we see after a recession. After a recession, unemployment declines, but it declines at a very slow speed. If we look at the last expansion that has started after the global financial crisis, we spent 10 years of declining unemployment and we never reached the bottom. Now, if you push this idea seriously of asymmetries, in some way, the US economy was not at full employment until maybe 2019. And it didn't last very long because then the global pandemic sent the US economy into a recession. Now that view of the world, which is an asymmetric view of the world, also has something to say about stabilization, either fiscal or monetary policy, because we always far away from potential. So it's just not a discussion about sort of potential itself, it's a discussion about how long does it take to get to potential. And if you stare at this picture, you're gonna get a sense that getting back to full employment might take many years, so many years that the US economy never has a period of full employment, at least if you look at this picture and you're looking for a stable low unemployment rate. Now this pushes us to ideas which are similar to the ones that come from the hysteresis literature that says stabilization policy needs to be more aggressive. And it needs to be more aggressive first because we, we can affect the long run, those are the scars that we don't wanna have, but also because it takes a long time to go back to whatever estimate of potential we have uh, and there must be some benefits of being closer to potential for a longer period of time. Now, back to the notion of potential output. Of course, we all know very well, I'm sure this audience is very familiar, the concept of potential output is key to define optimal fiscal policy. The first thing that we need to do whenever we see a fluctuation in output, when we see a shock, is try to figure out how much is permanent, how much is cyclical, because this captures the cyclical deviations that we're hoping fiscal policy or monetary policy could address. And the bigger the, the shock, the bigger the cyclical deviation, obviously the stronger the response. Potential output is also important because at any point in time, we're gonna worry about sustainability as well. And I'm aware that some presentations later will talk about sustainability. So we need to have an estimate of sort of the long-term level of GDP. So like the long-term for forecast of GDP to think about what is the optimal fiscal policy. Now, I'm not going to go through this table carefully, but again, this is the logic that we all have when we talk about fiscal policy. We have two types of shocks. If, if you look at the two columns that I have, permanent or cyclical, from a stabilization point of view, a permanent shock, there's very little we can do. We just have to accept what it is. In the case of a cyclical shock, we always want automatic stabilizers. I have it here as AS to work. And then if the shock is big enough, we obviously want to do a bigger response using discretionary policy. And this has also consequences when it comes to sustainability. What type of reactions should we do in terms of the sustainability of the debt or the fiscal policy? In the case of a permanent shock, we need to do some sort of fiscal consolidation, adjust expenditures or revenues to feed with the new potential output. In the case of a cyclical, we don't need to do a large consolidation. We just need to let automatic stabilizers work, maybe have some discretionary policy if there is any leftover in terms of unsustainable fiscal policy, we can deal with it later. So again, this is very familiar to all of us and it says understanding how much is permanent, how much is cyclical is going to be crucial to think about what type of response fiscal policy should have. Now, the issue that I've raised in some of my early research and others have raised similar issues is we measure potential output very imperfectly and we make mistakes. And that affects the way we think about this permanent versus temporary nature of shock, because if we get it wrong, we're gonna get the distinction wrong. This also affects the way we even measure fiscal policy, sort of the stance of fiscal policy. We're all familiar with calculating structural balances and structural balances can be thought as a target, but, but they're also sort of a source of information to think about what is the stance of fiscal policy at any point in time. If we get potential output wrong, we'll get the structural balance wrong and we'll get a conclusion about the current policy, which might be uh, unreasonable given that we got the potential output measure wrong. Now, these two bullet points are related. In both cases, we're making a mistake about potential output, but, but they can be separate. They can be effects which are sort of more relevant for one of the two bullet points. For example, if when we measure the structural balances, we're getting the elasticities of taxes and other spending potentially wrong, 
It might be that an estimate of potential output that is wrong hurts us in two ways. We don't understand what potential output is first, but also our measure of a structural balance is even more biased because we not measure on those elasticities, right? And again, we have experience with this in the previous global financial crisis where there was issues on, on the way we measure the elasticities of some components, in particular taxes, and how the structural measure of the balance was biased, possibly before the crisis and possibly after the crisis. Now, what do we know when we look at the data? So we make mistakes, what type of mistakes? Again, going back to my work, in the past, measures of potential output are incredibly procyclical. Every time we see a change in GDP, potential output reacts almost contemporaneously. So this comes from some early work that I've done. You see two columns here. These are all forecast errors. So these are surprises, surprises in GDP, surprises in potential GDP. When we say potential GDP, we mean estimates of potential GDP. There's a very strong correlation. This is for the Euro area in all these years. So the way you read this slide, it says in 2008, in 2009, there was a surprise, a downward revision to GDP. Immediately in the same year, we revised down potential GDP by an amount which is almost as large as GDP. So if you do a quick analysis through all this period, typically on a given year, if there's a surprise in GDP, if GDP falls by 1%, we typically revise potential output down by about two thirds. That's odd. If we think about how we normally think about potential output as something which is smoother and more stable, we just have a very strong cyclicality of our estimates of potential output that makes us pessimistic very fast. Now, if you look at this picture as well, if you look at some of the positive shocks, the columns which are going into the positive territory, sometimes the relationship is not that clear, which suggests that there could even be some asymmetries. So we tend to be very pessimistic when it comes to negative shocks. And whenever we have some sort of positive revision, we, we are not always as optimistic when it comes to potential output, which is the green column here. Now, that means uh, that if we have this procyclical potential output, this procyclical pessimism, it means that our errors can be costly, but they're costly in a way that if you believe in a world where there is hysteresis, where there are these scars, coming from cyclical shocks, the costs are very high. Why? Because once you make a mistake, you cannot fix it anymore because the, the fact that output has been depressed for a significant period of time is gonna have a, an effect of potential output. It means we cannot ever go back to the previous trend. At best, we can go to a trend that now is lower. And these are the permanent scars, which are gonna be the outcome of the wrong fiscal policy. Now, I, you don't need to look at all the numbers here, but basically this is coming from some of my research where I've tried to show this. I'm trying to understand how we change our potential output estimates over a long horizon. This is six years in response to a typical shock to GDP. So this is all coming using data from the IMF during the last crisis. So if we have a revision to GDP, a shock to GDP, what we normally would call a cyclical shock, if you, wait, if you wait a number of years, in this case, six years, what has happened to the estimate of potential GDP? And you see a coefficient, which is clearly bigger than one, which says every time you have a shock, this shock keeps building and building and building and leaving permanent scars, which are in fact bigger than the size of the initial shock. And this is a strong evidence that suggests that some of these scars, some of these histories as effects are real uh, and they matter on the way we think about potential GDP. Now, the final bullet point on this slide is also coming from some of my recent research. Some of this interaction between fiscal, sorry, between cyclical shocks, potential output, and our actions can lead to what I call a fiscal policy or in general, a monetary policy or stabilization policy doom loop. And what I have in mind is the following, imagine policymakers, academics, have a vision of the world, a view of the world where there is no hysteresis. So we assume it away. Every time there's a shock, we use some historical decomposition that says every shock is going to be two thirds permanent, one third transitory or 50 50, whatever the historical decomposition is. We will try to correct the cyclical shocks, not the permanent ones, because there's no room to correct those with the stabilization policies. If there is hysteresis, some of our actions, by being too timid, by not being aggressive enough, will lead to permanent effects of output. 
So exposed, we will see output being very permanent uh, or the effects of the output shock being very permanent. And that means that we will validate our original assumptions that a lot of the shocks are permanent but maybe they're not permanent. Maybe we made it permanent through our wrong fiscal policy or monetary policy. So this is about understanding how the error of shocks can propagate in a way that can create confusion to policymakers exposed. Exposed, it seems that we did the right thing, but it's just because we have a model that ignores hysteresis, it ignores the connection between the cycle and growth. So can we do better? What is it that we need to do to do better? I think the statement, I think, is straightforward. We need to use models that incorporate the possibility of scars, which I think is very rarely used these days. We need to think about models with hysteresis. We need to understand that hysteresis is going to work against fiscal policy consolidation if we ever start a process of fiscal policy consolidation, because we know that it's going to have fiscal consolidation is going to have an effect on growth. That's going to have a downward effect on GDP. And that's going to make the fiscal consolidation smaller than what we thought. Now, to build these models, we need to do some academic work, which I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we have a clear consensus on what drives growth. And without that consensus, it's very hard to think about how the cycle affects growth, how these hysteresis effects happen. We see them, we can measure them, but we need to understand better the channels through which they happen. And I, I don't think we're there. Now, because we're not there, we face uncertainty. Every time there's a shock, like the current shock, the COVID shock we're living through, we have to ask ourselves how much of it is permanent, how much of it is, is, is transitory. Now, a couple of suggestions, obviously not very a long list of suggestions, but some examples. First, we can rely on smoother versions of potential output. That's something that we can implement. We can try to avoid that procyclicality that we see in the data. When it comes to fiscal policy, we might try to avoid rules that are very much based on measures of the balance that require very precise estimates of tax elasticities, which I don't think we're good enough given the way we measure potential output. So the use of expenditure rules that do not rely as much on, on elasticities of taxes or, or measures of, of, of tax changes over the cycles might be better because it might avoid some of that procyclicality. And then I'm writing a sentence, which I think might be useful for, for the current crisis. We might just sort of like go faster than in the past, maximize stimulus in a way which might sort of be inconsistent with things we've done in the past, but under the assumption that scars are happening uh, and that might help us avoid the scars in the future. Now, I, I'll just show you a picture of sort of what the current crisis looks like according to recent IMF World Economic Outlook vintages. So this is for the euro area. The blue line is the, the forecast in October 19, 2019. The orange one is the forecast in October last year. And in gray, you see the forecast for potential GDP, where you're already seeing sort of scars built into this forecast. Of course, they might get wrong. It might be that this forecast, these scars are wrong and we don't end up there. But if we end up there, we start seeing a picture that starts resembling some of the scars we saw in the global financial crisis. So I think this is an issue that one cannot avoid and we have to think about the coming years to what extent policy can avoid scars or not.